Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Jerry Johnson. I'm the district director for Michigan State Extension for the Thumb, uh, the five counties of the Thumb. My home office is right here in this building. Um, and I want to welcome you on behalf of Extension to this event. Um, we're going to discuss Great uh, Lakes water levels, uh, something near and dear to our heart. Um, before I do that, uh, just quickly uh, some self promotion for Extension. Uh, if you have concerns with water or with agriculture or nutrition or uh, you know we've got all kinds of forums going on around the state right now where industrial hemp, uh, child nutrition, 4-H, uh, nutrition for income disadvantaged people, you name it, food security, environmental, tourism, uh, entrepreneurship, ask us first. We might have resources that you've already paid for through your tax dollars that we can help you with and if we don't we certainly can connect you to somebody that does. We're well connected. So again, thanks for uh, showing up. Um, also, thank you. We've got uh, Senator Lowers, I see, is here. I see Representative Hernandez is here. St. Clair County Commissioners, Chairman Bohm. Um, it, you know, in this county, you know, we, uh, Chairman Bohm declared a state of emergency not too long ago. All of us live, a lot of us live on the water, some live close. Um, I've lived all over the United States and returned back here. This is the best boating and water recreation for your money in the world to me, but certainly in the United States. But it's been challenging this year. It's been very difficult the further down river you, you go. Lots of challenges for folks on their seawall, their houses, et cetera. So hopefully you leave here armed with a little bit more information than you came in with. Um, and what I'd like to do in a minute, I'm gonna have Justin come up and uh, kind of speak on behalf of the county, but since he won't do it, Mark Breederland against the wall is here with uh, MSU Sea Grant. And MSU Sea Grant is one of the few areas uh, or few places ever where Michigan and Michigan State team up and we're on the same page. So Sea Grant is a joint venture uh, between Michigan, uh, Michigan State, and the federal government. And uh, it's something kind of unique. It's we, we really get the benefit of both universities and uh, we get the benefit of the extension outreach system. So we're able to do things in communities. So Mark's been with uh, Michigan State for 25 years. And uh, he formerly was worked in this office long before I got here. Um, he's over near Traverse City now, and he'll be kind of the MC and the host for you this evening. So again, thanks for coming, and I'm gonna have Justin come up now. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. So first off, thank you all for being here tonight. I'm really excited about how much information you're gonna have the opportunity to consume. Uh, we've had a challenging spring and summer, and we're looking at some fall off on the water levels here in our county, but I don't want everybody to be lulled into uh, what we could be looking at uh, moving into the winter time, uh, in the winter time and, and coming in the next spring. And so what we're looking to do today is arm you with the information that you need to protect your community, to protect your homes, and to protect your neighbors, right? Because that's what we're looking to do from an emergency management standpoint. So I'm really excited to have the MSU Sea Grant um, folks here to talk to you, to have the National Weather Service here, to have Keith here from the Army Corps of Engineers. And, uh, and I thank everybody for being here. So uh, that's really all I have. Thank you all for coming and uh, I'll turn it over to Mark. Mark. So again, thanks to you for coming, taking your time on this night and also for the people that are watching. Uh, you're soon going to hear from the Army Corps of Engineers. As you know, the, uh, the levels have really, um, we've been measuring them. We have excellent data for 100 years. That's amazing. That's about 1,200 months. Keith's going to go into the specifics of that. But we just looked and we just got the data in for the monthly average for August. So just a, when that ended a few days ago. And Lake Michigan and Huron, again, one lake because hydrologically they're connected. That's the sixth highest ever recorded. Number six. So all the other records were in 1986. Who remembers the high waters of 1986? Look at that. So we survived that. It was actually a lot higher then, but we're, we're facing it again and we want to understand uh, what's coming at it. So with that, I'm going to ask all four of our speakers if they would uh, come on up here and let me just introduce them. And um, this is really an A team of speakers that have uh, taken uh, time to, to drive up from various places where they're located. So um, just come on up here. 
and uh, I'm going to introduce uh, I'm going to introduce these four speakers. The plan for tonight is to hear from the Corps of Engineers first, and they're going to talk about the measurements of the kind of the static water levels, and then we're going to hear from the National Weather Service, and they're going to talk a little bit about the weather impacts on those static water levels at whatever level they are. Then we're going to hear from the um, Michigan's newly renamed agency, the Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy Department, and Rhonda Wycheck is here, and she's uh, from there, so we'll I'll introduce her. And then finally, we have uh, Dr. Dick Norton from the University of Michigan, and Dick is a coastal expert and also an attorney. So let me do the more official introductions. <laughs> Keith Kompaltowicz uh, from the Corps of Engineers. Keith is the chief of the Hydro Hydraulics and Hydrology Office. His office is in downtown Detroit in the McNamara Building. And the Corps of Engineers is tasked with the long-term management and bi-national coordination of the, uh, of the water level information. So Keith, thanks for coming. Next, from the National Weather Service in Detroit, as you know, they're in the White Lake, just near, not too far from Pontiac, Rich Pullman. Rich is the warning coordination meteorologist for the National Weather Service, and it's integral with um, various uh, warnings that come out, and you, you know how important the National Weather Service is, especially just seeing the national news and the importance of the job they did at the National Hurricane Center. So, Weather Service is really huge. Third, again, is Rhonda Wycheck. Rhonda is the chief uh, and the uh, coastal program manager for the Water Resources Division of the Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy Department. And uh, we're really glad that she was able to come. She has some information on coastal resiliency and also the coastal zone program that she manages is also kind of a, a partnership funding program through NOAA and some really good information there. And again, uh, finally, uh, Professor Norton from the University of Michigan. He's in the Taubman School of Planning, but he's a longtime uh, partner with Michigan Sea Grant, I think ever since he came to Michigan from North Carolina. So we're really glad that uh, Professor Norton was able to come here and uh, talk about some of the uh, coastal issues that he has. So um, one last thing, all the talks pretty much are non-regulatory. Like if you have specific questions about your property, things that you may be worried about that you might say, oh yeah, I wanna modify this or do something. We have some people from the regulatory side of the state and regulatory side of the federal government and uh, we have from the state, we have Andy Hartz and Beth. And they're, they're in the back corner. Would you guys raise your, raise your hand? And also, we have somebody from the federal government, the, the regulatory side of the Corps of Engineers. And uh, uh, he's also back at the table. So they're going to be here all night. If you have questions later on, um, you may want to pin them down, ask them about what process you need to go through, and you can talk to them specifics. But that's uh, their resource people here. We're really glad they've, they've been able to come. So um, we're going to pretty much go right through the speaker presentations because I think it really flows well. <laughs> if there's a one burning question after each speaker, we might be able to take that. But um, we are going to have an open period of questions and answers and dialogue towards the end. We, we promise to be out of here maybe 8.15ish at the latest. We don't want this to go on forever, but we want to get the maximum amount of information out that we can. So um, with that, I'm going to have the, the speakers are just going to flow from, from there, and we're going to have Keith Kompaltowicz from the Corps of Engineers come on up and uh, tell us about the latest, and he's just even sent out a press release today on the latest water levels. So thanks for coming, Keith. There's a, uh, again, a laser pointer. Mark's practiced saying my name a lot. He's aced it. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, thank, thank you, Mark. Um, it's great to see uh, a big crowd here. Um, it certainly speaks to the passion that people have about the Great Lakes. Uh, we're lucky to be surrounded uh, by them in Michigan, and um, I'm happy to be here to speak to you about uh, what I've spent uh, the past 18 years uh, with the Corps of Engineers focused on is the fluctuating water levels on the Great Lakes. Again, uh, Keith Kompaltowicz, and I'm chief of the Watershed Hydrology Branch uh, for the Corps of Engineers in Detroit. <laughs> so some quick notes about uh, the water levels that you're going to hear about from me today. Um, they, they don't reference a depth, but a surface elevation above sea level. Our datum that we use is IGLD 85, and it has its zero point near the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, which is why we 
uh, consider it uh, above sea level. Uh, the Corps of Engineers, uh, and Mark mentioned our 100 year data set, really focuses on the mean level of the entire lake surface, not necessarily at a specific point. So we focus on lake wide monthly means, which is that 100 year water level data set, and daily lake wide means, which we aggregate to turn into the monthly mean. Uh, we base them all on still water. So uh, we do not consider the meteorological forcings that might cause water levels to rise significantly at a specific location. Um, and, and Rich from the Weather Service will likely hit on a little bit of, of, of the atmospheric forcings that can cause uh, water levels to fluctuate greatly. We use a network of gauges surrounded, surrounding the lakes. Um, on Lakes Michigan and Huron, which we consider to be one lake because they're joined at the Straits, we use six gauges uh, in both the United States and Canada to come up with the lake-wide mean water level. Um, we were the official keeper of those statistics back to 1918, and we coordinate all this data and all these forecasts with our counterparts in Environment and Climate Change Canada. Because it's an international waterway, we want to make sure that the information is consistent across the international border, so we spent a lot of time discussing uh, what is the most appropriate data set to use uh, with our counterparts in Canada. Uh, and the primary drivers of these water level fluctuations are the changing weather, weather patterns and the resulting fluctuations in net basin supply, which I'll talk a little bit about. <laughs> so monitoring the levels. Um, we focus on what is going on in this green shaded area of the map that you see. So that's our Great Lakes Basin. So we track weather patterns, snowpack, stream flow, evaporation, ice cover, uh, precipitation, uh, you name it. If it impacts water levels, uh, we track it. And then I, I focus on the cross section because it does, uh, the, the Great Lakes do flow from the headwaters in Lake Superior, uh, through the St. Mary's River into Lakes Michigan and Huron, uh, through the St. Clair River, it's like Lake St. Clair, Detroit River, Lake Erie, over Niagara Falls to Lake Ontario, and finally out into the Atlantic Ocean. There are two points in the system where the outflows from the lakes can be managed. Uh, the first is the outlet of Lake Superior into the St. Mary's River. Uh, that's at the Sioux Locks facility, a uh, hydropower plant, a uh, 16-gated structure, and the locks themselves uh, are, are used to manipulate the outflow from Lake Superior. And then the outflow from Lake Ontario into the St. Lawrence River is managed at the Moses Saunders Hydropower Dam. Uh, just because we can uh, regulate the outflow, that does not mean we have full control over lake levels because of that regulation of outflow. The uh, larger factors, again, are that weather patterns, the rainfall, the snow melt, the runoff that we get uh, that really drives lake levels. Here are the gauges that we use to monitor the lakes. Again, um, a number of them. Uh, we use a network around each lake. Again, Michigan and Huron, there are six of them. Those six gauges were selected because they have a very long and consistent record um, extending back to 1918. As you can see, they're located in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Ludington, Michigan, Harbor Beach, Michigan, Mackinac City, Michigan, and then two in Canada at Thessalon and Tobermory. A quick look at where we are currently on the lakes. This is our water level report that updates daily um, on our website. Again, these are lake-wide mean surface elevations. I highlight the, the two red boxes. The, the upper one is the running average for the month. That's really the, the level that we track and forecast. And then I have this, the lower red box are the maximums uh, for the month of September. We track things on a monthly basis. Each month has its own set of statistics. So uh, we've reached some record highs already this year, uh, especially on uh, Superior, St. Clair, Erie and Ontario came very close to setting a record on uh, Lakes Michigan and Huron in June, fell just shy, and again in July. Um, and again, this period of record goes back to 1918, so it's a very long and, and often studied data set uh, extending back 100 years. So here's that data set uh, for all the lakes. This is uh, all of our monthly mean recorded <laughs> levels back to 1918, uh, is the blue line. The red line is the long-term average. 
And a couple of things I want to point out here, again, this is also available on our website, uh, is There it is. So right here, focus on that point right there. That's January of 2013. That's the lowest lake-wide mean surface elevation for Lake Michigan here on in this period of record, January of 2013. The 24-month period from January 2013 to December 2014 is the largest 24-month rise of any 24 month periods in this period of record. So we went from record low to above average very quickly. And now we are near the upper end of the range. So we've covered the six foot range for the most part on Lakes Michigan Huron in about six years, which is quite remarkable. So I'll take you through the factors that, that impact water levels. And, and we track a quantity of water called the net basin supply. And that's representative of the precipitation that falls directly on the lake surface, plus the runoff from the surrounding land minus evaporation. That's really the driving factor for water level fluctuations. You take that and that basin supply and lump it together with the upstream inflow. Uh, all the lakes, with the exception of Lake Superior, have an inflow from the upstream lake. You lump those two quantities together and you get the net total supply. So when the net total supply is greater than the outflow to the downstream lake, your lake level will rise. And the opposite is true. If the outflow is greater than the net total supply, the lake levels will decline. We are in the period now where we're seeing the lakes enter their periods of seasonal declines as net basin supply is drying up as it typically does this time of year. So here's the annual fluctuation of water levels, uh, and it matches the hydrologic cycle that we see in the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, the lakes start at their lowest point in the winter uh, as the precipitation that's falling usually accumulates on the ground in the form of snow rather than running directly off into the lakes. When we start to see warmer temperatures in the spring, that snow melt uh, feeds the lakes and, and streams that, that uh, run into the lakes, combines with liquid precipitation to drive the seasonal rise. Uh, the lakes peak in the summertime. At the same time they're peaking, they're also warming. And uh, as they reach their summer peak, uh, they're also getting, uh, reaching their peak temperatures and we get these cool fall nights. Uh, that drives evaporation and that pulls the lakes back down um, as uh, toward their winter low. And this pattern is very repeatable of rising in the spring, peaking in the summer, declining in the fall. It's just the magnitudes of those rises uh, that are impacted by the weather. So uh, just recently we had a very significant seasonal rise on Lake Michigan because of the very healthy snowpack that was existent in the basin uh, from this winter, followed by a very, very wet spring, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So high water level impacts, and if you live on the lakes, you're, you're very aware of, of these, but shoreline erosion, smaller beaches, coastal flooding, especially during periods of significant onshore winds and wave action, leading to property damage. Uh, we get greater impacts from seiche events, which are wind-driven water level rises. Uh, this happens on Lake Erie uh, quite a bit, but it's not unique to Lake Erie. We've seen water level differences between Toledo, Ohio, and Buffalo, New York, with this strong southwest wind of upwards of 15 feet. And that's not a change in the volume of water in the lake, it's just where the water is located. And when that wind dies down, the water just doesn't go back and stay there, it sloshes back and forth for a couple of days while the energy is dissipated, very similar to a, a youngster jumping in the tub and uh, causing the water in the tub to, to uh, fluctuate. <clears throat> Uh, something that we're going to pay very close attention to uh, heading into this winter is ice jams, especially on the St. Clair River and at the outlets of the rivers and streams that empty into the lakes. Uh, ice jams form when, and I have a, a slide on this, but pretty quickly, uh, the uh, accumulation of ice in the river can pretty much stop the flow of water. Water level behind that jam rises, the water level downstream declines quickly. We've also seen submerged structures. Uh, especially during heavy winds. Um, I'll show a couple of photos. Uh, the, 
here's a submerged structure in South Haven, Michigan, um, during a, a very heavy wind event. Uh, and just some other high water photos. This is Stony Point in Lake Erie. This is Grand Traverse Harbor up in North, uh, in the Keweenaw Peninsula in Lake Superior. Uh, the, the concrete ripped up as a result of a very heavy storm, uh, ripping the, the lake up something fierce. And then this is on Lake St. Clair. Uh, just, this is a Great Lakes wide um, problem or, or Great Lakes wide issue with, with the water levels being high, Great Lakes basin wide. Just some more localized uh, photos. Uh, the court does operate a few water level gauges on the Great Lakes of our own, mostly on the connecting channels. Uh, this is our south channel gauge on Harsons Island in 2012, during the very low point. And then just this past June, uh, the same location. Um, so you can see you know, the, the full range there of uh, fully exposed seawall to not much seawall left. So focusing on uh, ice jams for a minute, this is a, a kind of a unique um, issue on, on the St. Clair River when we have ice that builds in the southern end of Lake Huron. Uh, it gets broken up uh, through many different means. Uh, it flows down uh, the, the river and it gets to the delta where the channels are narrow and Lake St. Clair is also usually completely frozen over so the ice doesn't have anywhere to go. So it builds upon each other, it builds upon, and it can build on, a, on top of itself so much that it stops that flow of water. And that can cause flooding upstream of the ice jam and rapidly declining levels uh, on the downstream. Um, some of the communities that have, have experienced flooding, Algonac, East China, uh, the village of St. Clair, uh, certainly have dealt with this uh, in the past. Uh, we dealt with it uh, last year. A couple weeks ago, or uh, a couple times last year, um, the one that we like to show uh, is uh, in 1987. Uh, this was coming off of the record highs of 1986, and how we kind of get an idea of where these ice jams are, watching the different water level gauges that we have on the Saint Clair River, both the Canadian agencies, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the Corps monitor water levels. Uh, a number of gauges on the St. Clair River, and we can tell by looking at these gauges where there might be an issue. So focusing on the purple line, which is uh, the St. Clair State Police gauge, and the brownish line is the Port Lambton, Ontario gauge. And you can see that right here, the, the St. Clair gauge rises, the Port Lambton gauge declines. That's indicative of some sort of a restriction in the river flow due to ice between those two gauges. Uh, this event uh, uh, it w was very, uh, a very interesting one due to the duration, due to the number of Coast Guard assets that were employed to help this uh, alleviate the situation. Uh, what the but uh, the, the Coast Guard had a number of assets and what the Coast Guard does is just move upstream and downstream in the river to attempt to get the ice moving and the, and the water flowing. And you can see as they were successful in doing that, the water levels returned to their pre-ice jam situation. So a couple of other things that we watch for are very strong northerly winds uh, that can push more water into the St. Clair River. When there's more water coming in via uh, southern Lake Huron that can be that can exit the river uh, because of ice that can also cause some issues with, and with, without really seeing uh, this divergence in the gauges. Uh, it's just there's more water in the river. Um, but we, we spent a lot of time in the winter uh, tracking this in, in collaboration with the Coast Guard and working with the Weather Service for flood warnings. And uh, our latest forecasts have the level of Lake Huron um, very near where it was in, in 1987. So it, it's something that we're gonna have to certainly pay attention to, uh, especially if we get a, a significantly cold winter with, with a good ice cover on the lakes. So how do we get here? Um, you know, I, I mentioned that, that large rise in, in water level on Lakes Michigan and Huron since 2013. And, and these charts uh, show a couple of things. The, the bar portion is that net basin supply quantity that I talked about, uh, tracked or, or aggregated annually as a measure over 
the water surface. So it's, it's inches of water over the lake surface. Um, and you can see more often than not over the past six to seven years, we've seen above average net basin supply, which means we've had more wet weather uh, than not over the lakes. And then the bottom portion of this chart is the water level trace. So you can see when we started to see these repeated years with greater than average net basin supply, the water levels responding by rising. So that's how we got to, you know, uh, very general terms, very wet weather over the last several years. Um, this, uh, the, the water level rises that we saw in the spring were driven by extreme amounts of rainfall falling on top of already saturated soils because of a very healthy snowpack, as well as a very wet fall of 2018. So this uh, map shows 60-day precipitation totals ending June 19th. And there are many places in the Great Lakes Basin pushing 20 inches of rainfall in those 60 days. Uh, so all of this water was making its way uh, into the lakes on top of the healthy snowpack that we already had. Um, just another look at, at uh, stream flows and runoff in April and May, again, driving the very fast water level rise uh, that we saw this spring. Take you through some of our uh, water level uh, charts that we develop. Again, these are all on our website. I'll show uh, Lake Superior, Lakes Michigan, Huron, and Lake St. Clair first. The red line is the recorded daily uh, lakewide mean. Uh, the blue line is that same value for last year. The green dots are our latest forecast. And then if you can make out the vertical red lines that are plotted with the a green dot, that's the range of potential water levels should wetter or drier than average conditions occur. So you can, you can see here for the most part, uh, and I'll focus on Lakes Michigan here on, um, the, the forecast is for higher water levels uh, than last year through the end of 2019, and then starting 2020, higher than we started 2019. Um, so again, just below the records, but still we have not seen water level conditions like this since 1986 and uh, 1987. Um, at Lake St. Clair, very similar as well. Um, for the most part, at or slightly above where we were a year ago through the end of 2019, and then starting 2020, very similar to where we were uh, starting this year. Um, Lake Erie, again, uh, all the colors and, and lines are the same. You can see the record highs that were set on, on Lake Erie. Uh, but again, um, very high water levels compared to average, some of the highest in the period of record, expected to continue. Um, over the next six months. Our water level outlook. This isn't a, a forecast per se, but it's a tool that we use to answer what if questions. We're, we're getting a lot of questions about what can I expect next summer. Our, our official forecast only goes out six months, um, which is signified by the red shaded area uh, on these charts. Uh, the, the grayish shaded area is the range of potential water levels should we see conditions of, of the past repeat themselves. And then we, what we do is we pick out certain scenarios that uh, either answer questions that we're getting or, or something that's uh, interesting. So the question we're getting is, what's it gonna take for water levels to decline significantly for next year? And those scenarios here are 19, 1998, 1999, and 1976, and 1977. So the 1998-1999 scenario was marked by a very warm, snowless winter across the Great Lakes, and that really started that uh, long-term uh, period of below average water levels. That uh, The lake spent 15 or plus years below average, and that scenario that 1998-1998 winter was was kind of the the catalyst to that. On the flip side, you know, what would lead us to even higher water levels next year? 
and that would be 72, 73, or 92, 93, which were marked by very wet weather. 72, 73 were the records prior to the 1986 records. So we use this and update this uh, monthly. Um, we'll be updating with uh, new scenarios here at the beginning of October. Um, but again, this is help, helps us to answer some of the what if questions that we get. I invite you to visit our, our water levels webpage. Um, we put all of our forecast information there. Uh, all of the information that I talked about is there. Um, contact information, um, links to other resources. And another resource that I'd like to highlight is our Living on the Coast booklet. This was developed in partnership with the Sea Grant uh, during the 1990s. Um, the information in this booklet is still very valid. However, the contact information isn't. So please don't use it to call somebody, but it is a good read um, uh, and has a lot of good information in it. Here's my contact information. So if you have questions on water levels, if you want to subscribe to any of our forecast products, uh, need help interpreting a forecast product or interpreting the water level product that we have, please give me a call. I'd love to talk to you. We've been doing it uh, quite often, uh, especially this year. I've given this uh, or a version of this presentation countless times to groups like this in Ludington, uh, to congressional representatives, to city managers, to uh, emergency managers. So uh, we want to make sure that the best information is getting out there. So please uh, don't hesitate to give me a call. I'd be happy to talk to you or, or direct you to somebody in my staff that can that can help you out. And with that, we will turn it over to Mark. I don't know if we're going to do a is question. There one burning question for Keith right now. <laughs> if not, we're going to have Rich uh, come on up and just keep it keep it is going. So. Yes, it is. So we'll get that information to you. Thank you for the question. Mark. I think there was one right, oh, one right here. I just have one. I think it's going to be easy for you. You said Superior comes into Michigan and Huron, uh, so they're considered one. Is the outflow of Lake Michigan down into the Chicago River? The outflow of Lake Michigan here on is the St. Clair River. There is a very small diversion of water uh, through the Chicago area to the Mississippi, but uh, that is very small in terms of and has no impact on Lake Michigan. So Michigan still comes through Huron? Yeah, yes, the, the, the vast majority by a long shot flows out of Lakes Michigan here onto the St. Clair River. Okay, great. We'll get some more questions later. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Oh. I don't know if we can go back, so we'll just, we'll just keep it going. We'll get it, we'll get his information at the end. I'll get it to you. We just click on your switch. All right, well, thank you for inviting me out here this evening. Uh, I am the warning coordination meteorologist at our weather service office in uh, Pontiac, Michigan. We're known as the Detroit office, White Lake office, Pontiac office. All of those work, and so you can call us in, in any way. Uh, talk a little bit about what we do here at the weather service, just give that overview, uh, and then talk about how the meteorology affects uh, those lake levels that uh, Keith talked about. Uh, the short-term effects, uh, whether it's from the storm systems, thunderstorms, um, and uh, some new terminology that you may have heard of along the way. Uh, at the Weather Service, again, we're part of NOAA. Uh, that uh, map up there kind of shows you the puzzle pieces of how they're all put together. Uh, there's 122 local offices just like ours. They each have their warning responsibility for that area of the country. Uh, we cover Southeast Michigan, uh, 17 counties, uh, from the tip of the thumb down to the Ohio border. Uh, we do have responsibility for the marine forecast for Lake Huron, Lake St. Clair, and the Michigan waters of Lake Erie. And then some of the other forecasts and warnings that we are responsible, obviously the uh, tornado and severe thunderstorm warnings, those watches, winter storm watches and warnings, a seven day forecast, all the hydrologic products, which are the flooding products, um, and um, also uh, providing support to our local government officials, uh, whether it's for a special event or for uh, a significant weather event, 
Uh, we're there to work with uh, directly with our emergency management, and then through the emergency management, uh, we work with all the police and fire uh, across Southeast Michigan. So, uh, as Keith was pointing out, in that uh, the the net uh, water supply there, one of those arrows was the precipitation, and so if we look at the one year uh, precipitation uh, for the state of Michigan. Uh, was the third wettest out of 124 years. And so that's what, how long the climate database is for NOAA for on a state by state. Individual sites may go back farther, like Detroit goes back to about 1870, but uh, for the state by state climatology is 124 years. You can go back to three years and you can see the Great Lakes Basin pretty represented with the darkest color, indicating uh, the record wettest Three years time span of any three year time span in 124 years. And if we go with the uh, five year time span, you sum it all up over five years and you have that moving window across 124 years, you can see the Great Lakes Basin pretty represented with the, uh, with the records. So that's just one of those arrows uh, in, that, uh, in that supply. And, and at the end, I kind of talk about one of the other arrows with the evaporation, and we look at the temperature and precipitation outlook uh, through the National Weather Service. So the short term, hours to days worth of water level rises, what sort of features are, can cause that change? Uh, we have those low pressure systems, and this is especially concerning as we get into the fall season. Uh, we all know about the gales in November, and this is when we typically have the strongest wind events in the Great Lakes because it's the largest average temperature difference between the air and the water. And so you have that warm water, you get the first cold air masses of the winter season coming over that warm water. That creates an unstable situation, unstable atmosphere and that really can help generate the winds. It actually brings the winds down from five or 10,000 feet, and helps bring those gusty winds all the way down to the surface. And so that's why the gales in November are, are well known and, uh, and folklore is written about them. And it's a much of a concern as we head into this season with the high water levels. I have the radar loop of a, of a squall line that moved through in July. And these thunderstorm complexes, the more organized they are, they can generate um, their own wind field and can create havoc on those lake levels in, in the short term. Some of those terms that are used, especially with the thunderstorms, uh, satius we have heard about. Uh, a new term that you may or may not have heard about is meteor tsunamis. Um, and it's not necessarily the wind with the meteor tsunami, it's actually the pressure uh, field with a thunderstorm complex. Uh, and it's really quite remarkable, a very notable one happened in Ludington about 18 months ago. And uh, we're fortunate here in the Great Lakes that one of the worldwide experts on meteor tsunamis is at our office. Uh, it mainly affects Lake Michigan because of the geography of Lake Michigan and the fact that they get more thunderstorms moving from the plain states into Lake Michigan. Uh, so it's much more of a Lake Michigan phenomenon because of the way the lake is set up. Uh, but we have seen some of those quick rises and falls in our data uh, here in Southeast Michigan with some of the thunderstorm events. So as I mentioned, low pressure systems. Uh, this might be a worst case scenario for the uh, Lake Huron shoreline from Port Huron all the way up to the tip of the plum. This is the Hurricane Sandy uh, as it moved inland and we had uh, recorded wind gusts up to 75 miles an hour out here at Fort Gratiot at the Coast Guard Station. Uh, so that might be a worst case scenario with our current water conditions. This happened in 2012. If you remember, Keith was talking about the near record low levels there in January of 2013. Uh, so these are going to cause significant uh, perturbations in the uh, water levels. Um, and the combination of not only the wind driving the water levels higher, but now you're going to add such strong winds on top of it. You're talking about waves that can be uh, you know, certainly 10 to 20 feet on top of that increasing overall water level. So you got the pounding waves on top of it. So uh, certainly an area of concern as we get through the fall and into the winter season when we have these big 
low pressure systems uh, that uh, form across the country. So for our thunderstorms, uh, both the wind and the pressure fields uh, can be affected around the thunderstorm complexes, uh, and that can affect the water levels. And so this is our Algonac gauge. And this one I'm pointing out just because I happened to uh, uh, experience it a little bit. Uh, that one that's there in the early morning hours, the date on there is uh, May 23rd. I came up here to Marysville to do an outreach event with all the school kids. Nice squall line moved across. Uh, then I, we had a meeting to get ready for uh, uh, safety aspects with the Jobby Nooner event in Lake St. Clair. And as I was talking to the authorities there, they mentioned that with that thunderstorm complex, the water had moved over uh, the uh, roads there in Algonac. And that's that quick peak that you saw right there. Uh, May 25th, uh, we had like three or four rounds of thunderstorms, produced a lot of inland flooding in Frankenmuth and Vassar. Uh, but you can see all the wild perturbations there. Uh, you know, it's four inches, but that four inches uh, can make differences uh, along the shoreline. Uh, then speaking of, we seem to have a lot of severe weather hit our events uh, this year. And uh, so during the Jobby Nooner Day, uh, also the day that we had the PGA Tournament in downtown Detroit, we had severe thunderstorms form over Detroit, affect all these events. And you can see uh, the, the perturbations of the lake levels there with Lake St. Clair and Windmill Point down towards Detroit, right at the uh, intersection there with Lake St. Clair and, uh, and uh, the Detroit River. And you can see how, how much of a water change we had and how quickly that happened with the thunderstorm complexes. So as I mentioned, uh, some of the newest research uh, about the media tsunamis, uh, which is really the pressure field around the thunderstorm, and it is just that quick burst as the graph is trying to indicate there. Uh, Seish is a uh, little bit more of a long-term effect. Uh, in the Great Lakes that we're responsible for with Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie, the, the Seish effect we can see on Lake St. Clair in about a two hour time period, it takes about 12 hours with a longer lake for Lake Erie. Um, and when we look at the um, Seish's example here, um, this is a, a high wind event for, get the uh, pointer here, there we go. This is a high wind event for the Toledo area for, the, uh, for uh, this time period in uh, June. But uh, you can see how it goes, there's a rhythm to the peaks and valleys here. And that does correspond to 12 hours on the timeline. I know it's a little hard to see uh, on here, but there's a 12 hour time step with that, the peaks and valleys, just the ebbs and flows with the wind. Uh, even a light wind will produce the small perturbations across the lake uh, basin, uh, both in Lake St. Clair and in Lake Erie especially. So at the Weather Service, what we're trying to do with uh, letting people know about these uh, water encroaching on normally dry areas, we try to issue the watches, warnings, and advisories uh, to let you know what's uh, going on there. And so as our water levels were rising through the spring, uh, we were going based off of our, our guidance here and issuing lakeshore flood watches, one to three days in advance when we were expecting water to start encroaching on a land that was affecting property and our roads. Uh, and then as we got into that one to, two time, one to two day time period, we would issue either an advisory, if we expected it to be uh, a minor, um, uh, minor flood event, maybe just encroaching on the property, not actually surrounding any property, not getting up to the property, maybe not completely over the roadways. And what we have done with these advisories and warning products, uh, you can see the warning there is, a uh, warning is issued for a life-threatening or property affecting event. And so we worked with all our emergency managers across the coastal areas uh, as we were getting to levels that we hadn't seen since 86. And obviously there's been new building uh, there's been mitigation, and so the 86, 87 um, references, reference points weren't necessarily as valid, so we did have to work with our emergency management partners across all our coastal areas to try to get a handle on that. 
and uh, we also uh, had to, uh, we also had the understanding that I don't think anybody here would have wanted a lakeshore flood warning in effect from May until today. Uh, and so we tried to highlight the events, uh, a, a big east wind event, um, uh, as big as they can get in the summertime. And so we tried to highlight the events that would bring about an even higher water level rise than what you were dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's what we ended up doing. Um, we mainly issued lakeshore flood advisories for the Lake Huron shoreline from Port Huron up to the tip of the thumb. Uh, not that we have the bluffs that you have on Lake Michigan, but there is a bit of a rise. And so you're mainly dealing with beach erosion, damage to things in the water, docks and watercraft and the like. Um, and so there's not as much inundation of property and uh, road systems. And the flatter lands uh, around Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie, Saginaw Bay, um, uh, that water can be pushed inland a lot farther uh, with the, the flatter terrain. And so with, there we were issuing lakeshore flood warnings. And um, it's not just the east wind, uh, with Anchor Bay and Lake St. Clair, certainly any south, southwest or west wind that can push up into Anchor Bay and into portions of St. Clair and Macomb counties. That's an example of what the product looks like. We talked about levels, how much of a rise you're gonna have, the time window to expect, uh, the winds that are gonna cause that. And then for the St. Clair River, uh, we have responsibility to issue a flood warning uh, for that river. Now we have, I think about three or four different types of flood warnings. And I know it's very confusing. Uh, we're working actually to simplify this a little bit or, or make it a little more clear. Uh, maybe not necessarily simpler, but make it clearer for people to take the appropriate action. Because we do have the flash flood warning. Uh, we have a river flood warning for an actual river gauge like the Hamburg River out in uh, Livingston County, uh, all the Clinton River systems in Macomb County. Um, and then the Flint and Saginaw rivers across the north. So we also have this generic flood warning for things that aren't flash floody, like in the spring when the snow melts, but also when um, uh, we have river systems that don't have a gauge on them. Uh, we, and, and so there's where the St. Clair River uh, falls in line. So we do work a lot with the Corps and with uh, St. Clair County Emergency Management and work with Justin to get the right uh, messaging out there. And again, we didn't need to have a river or aerial flood warning for the St. Clair River all summer long. And so we try to highlight the events. And so this is going to be issued uh, for the um, high water wind driven events in the summer and springtime, but also for those ice uh, blockage events that we get in the wintertime. All right, so where do we stand on our uh, outlook here? Uh, since the weather is the big driver here at the lakes level, the National Weather Service has a climate prediction center, and they are once a month always issuing a 13-month forecast out in the future. So their forecast for the, uh, for the outlooks go out for 13 months. The big ones that make uh, most of the um, news and hit through the media are the one month and three month outlooks, but there are outlooks out there for next summer if you want to take a look at that. One of the big drivers of uh, climate weather prediction is the El Nino and La Nina cycle. And just to review, the uh, El Nino is going to be the, uh, the warmer waters off of the coast of South America and the Pacific Ocean along the equator. La Nina is the cooler waters. And of course, there are neutral conditions, which are about average conditions. Um, the forecast uh, is for us to be in this neutral condition, which is where we've been this summer. Uh, the gray bars indicate basically greater than a 50% probability of being at neutral condition uh, all the way into uh, next spring. Uh, neutral conditions sometimes can be our worst winters around here, uh, but it's not a lock because in the Great Lakes and in the Northeast part of the country, 
we are farther away from the Pacific Ocean than California or Texas or Florida. So they're much more influenced by El Nino or La Nina than we are here in the Great Lakes. And unfortunately, the things that really drive our climate forecast really can only be accurately predicted about one month in advance, maybe up to a month or two in advance. And so our long range outlook forecast um, are best one to two months in advance. Uh, and with that said, let's take a look. <laughs> Uh, so our autumn forecast, uh, you see all the red shading up there for the temperature. That is not necessarily a forecast of above normal temperatures. It means we have a better chance of a warm fall than having a cool fall. Uh, and then the bottom is the precipitation. You see our fall right now is in the white and there's actually a tiny EC written there means you have an equal chance of above normal precipitation, normal precipitation, or below normal precipitation. <laughs> so, if you have a three-sided coin, <laughs> so as we look into the winter, um, the, uh, the neutral condition um, outline is sort of there with the better chance of cooler temperatures in the northern plains. Uh, most of the country has got a better chance of being warmer than normal, but the precipitation forecast is a better chance of being above normal also in the winter. The main winter outlook is issued in October and then updated in November. So pay attention, around November 1st, we'll have our outlook out there and uh, we'll have a much better handle on what the winter looks like. And then heading into the spring, not too surprising precipitation. Uh, it's a hard thing to forecast in the outlook. So the entire country has the equal chances, nine months in advance. Uh, temperature wise, uh, the south half of the country looks like it's gonna be a better chance of above normal conditions uh, and uh, equal chances up here in the Great Lakes. So we still have that chance of having a cool spring. Um, so that's where we stand as far as an outlook. Again, the third Thursday of every month, these are updated. Uh, so you can look at it uh, there. Thanks, Rich. Keep hanging on to your questions. Rhonda Wycheck, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good evening. Oh my goodness. How's everyone this evening? Great. Um, real pleasure to be here this evening to talk to you about my program, going in a little direction um, beyond the, you've seen a lot of the technical, why the Great Lakes, um, up so high and maybe potentially going higher record um, levels and then some really good information about the weather. I'm Rhonda Wycheck and I am um, from the Coastal Management Program and I want to start by saying there's a couple of flyers I did um, bring. Um, one would be on my program that's non-regulatory because I am non-regulatory program. I also brought a fact sheet from Eagle to answer some questions about the regulatory factors that um, Andy and, and um, Beth are our experts in. And I also want to introduce um, Madeline Gorman. She's with me tonight. She's the water, Coastal Waters Coordinator. Her focus area is, is coastal storms and flooding. Um, I'm a native of Michigander. Um, we all know that the lakes define us. Um, the Coastal Program is a mature program. It's been around for 40 years. We are a cousin of the Sea Grant programs. We are also funded and supported by the federal government, NOAA, um, as a non-regulatory program. We're a body of 35 coastal states, islands, and territories. Our mission is to help protect, restore, enhance, <coughs> and wisely develop our coastal resources. Um, we are a sliver of the state um, as far as a thousand feet in from the ordinary high water mark. Our target audience, our main objectives is to partner. That's why we have partners here with President um, with Sea Grant. We also have partners that are local, um, St. Clair County, which are uh, quite a bit with Lori. Um, on water trails, but we also want to talk to you tonight about what we're doing with resiliency. And what we're trying to do with this slide is you can't go it alone. That one program can deal with all the things that we need to deal with when we're talking about helping communities be resilient. We align really closely with NOAA. These are the five focus areas that NOAA um, has the coastal states, islands, and territories focus on. It's the coastal waters, storms, and flooding. It's the coastal habitat. It's the hazards, erosion on our Great Lakes um, proper. It's our coastal community development, and as well as our um, 
um, public access with water trails. Interesting enough, we started an initiative three years ago. Seems like that was a magic number three years ago was kind of a quiet time to start make, let's, let's get ahead of the, the game and all of a sudden we're like right in it. Um, we are working with a host of partners to conduct research on what it means to be a resilient coastal community. How can a community uh, deal with the things that we're dealing with right today with the high water levels, coastal storms, and all the other factors that you just heard about and adapt and bounce back. Um, and, and land on our feet. So a hazard community is defined as those that can deal with all those factors in a meaningful way. So what does our program do? We're not, again, we're not regulatory. We work with communities to help them understand all the data that you just saw, and including we're collecting even more data on the parcel level and community level that doesn't really exist at that federal nor level. So we're working with um, Michigan Tech University, um, University of Michigan, um, a planning body called LEA and Sea Grant to help define what it means in a planning method for a hazard ready community. So managing coastal hazards, we're looking at what does the coastal community need to do to deal with what we dealt with three years ago, kind of go with the flow, things look okay, we have some time to plan, to now the perfect storm. So it's the perfect storm, um, the expected, and then what we thought was the normal three years ago. So we're partnering to um, help communities. We're developing some technical assistance and data. Um, on this sheet that you have that I brought, um, there's a couple of documents that are on our website, Survive and Thrive. This was sent out to all, late, all of the coastal communities in our state, um, so your local officials have received this. And one of the things that um, Dick would talk about, because we're really sharing this platform tonight with, with Dr. Norton, is how do we work with coastal communities. This is Grand Haven. I'm using this as a West Side example only because this is a community that we've walked through from the beginning to pretty much where we hope to work with a lot of more communities. We provided funding for the community to develop a resilient master plan. And additionally, we have helped the community develop a zoning ordinance because with most of the coast, the authorities for setbacks or the authorities to protect are in the hands of the local officials. So the regulations that we have for the state and the Andy and Beth can talk much more in depth about have limits like most regulations, but your local units of government can pass ordinances, as you all know, that we can help divine that's reasonable and that balances between wise development and protection of the habitat and the resources. And as I turn this over to Dr. Norton, I just want to again recognize that this is a team effort and that we're actually in this three year um, avenue that we're on with resiliency, we're on your side of the state. So we're looking for communities to work with. We're working with communities that we can bring this team of experts into and help you develop a resilient master plan. And I realized that that's kind of like the long view. This is a marathon for us. Um, we don't know exactly when the lake levels will go down and up, but what we want to try to do is help you define a resilient master plan for the low and the high. So again, this is my information. Um, I can leave my card and I'll be here for the rest of the evening. And I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dick. I have a really hard time standing in one place. I move a lot. So I'm going to try and not move too far away from the microphone um, while I do that. I'm Dick Norton. I teach in the Urban and Regional Planning Program at the University of Michigan. I'm both a planner and a lawyer. I studied coastal management in North Carolina for my doctoral work a long time ago. And I've been here at U of M in Michigan since about 2000. So I've been doing this work for a while. Um, usually I look out in the crowd and if I see lots of Spartan green, I say, hi, I'm from Ann Arbor, and I'm here to save you. <laughs> You'll see I have a very dry sense of humor. As you know. so, and then I see how many people throw things at me. Um, we did a study in, in about the uh, 20 aughts, um, collected master plans from communities around the state. Michigan has, Michigan truly is the Great Lakes state. One of my colleagues has a bumper sticker that points out four of the five Great Lakes prefer Michigan. 
Um, we have more, we have 62% of the shoreline of the U.S. side of the Great Lakes. We have gobs and gobs of shoreline. Uh, there are 318 local units of government, counties, townships, cities, and villages, that touch a Great Lake or a connecting waterway. Let me say that again, 318 units of local government. We have so much government in the state of Michigan, it's all at the local level. And for reasons I'll talk about in a minute, it really is the locals that have the predominant uh, um, responsibility to do a lot of what we need to do in terms of managing our Great Lake shorelines. So we collected a set of master plans from all of these communities from a, a sampling of them and found that only about two thirds of them are actually doing planning. And of those that are doing planning, less than half of them had anything in their plans about coastal areas and almost three quarters of them had no policies to speak of with regard to Great Lakes. I like to say Michigan's Great Lakes coastal communities you wouldn't know it except they have a picture of a lighthouse on their master plan and that's it. That's the only thing in the plan. So a lot of our work has been focused on how do we get coastal communities to pay more attention to managing their Great Lakes shoreland areas and to do all of the things that they want to do. So I'm going to talk first about taking some of the scientific, I'm going to exercise both sides of your brain tonight. And I'm a professor, so I ask questions. So you have to be prepared to yell out answers in the crowd. I'm going to talk about some of the physical complexity. So the way the lakes go up and down is actually pretty unique. So if you're in an ocean coastal state, everybody's worried about sea level rise. And they're talking about sea level rise happening on the order of inches over the course of decades, right? Most of the predictions are what it, what's it going to look like in 2050. The Great Lakes go up by six feet over the course of six years, we just heard. Right, the level of change on the Great Lakes is phenomenal. It's not like anything anybody else experiences. The problem is, two problems. One, people want to build in exactly the most beautiful, hazardous, and fragile places, right? And then these lakes have this bad habit of going down long enough for people to forget they're going to come back up. But they come back up. So we're always in this kind of ongoing tension um, with the dynamics of the system. And then the third piece, I'll just mention it now, is the Great Lakes are geologically young features. They were formed by the retreat of the glaciers about 10 to 13,000 years ago, carved out as the glaciers retreated. And, and they're slowly decompressing too. Have you heard of that? There's this isostatic rebound effect because the, they're still kind of decompressing from the, uh, the bottom half of the basin at least. And so that's affecting kind of where the water levels go over time. Because they're geologically young, the predominant behavior on Great Lakes shorelines is erosion. It's erosion. Over the long term, the lakes are eroding slowly away, or they're getting fatter. The lakes are getting flatter. The waters are moving landward. That's just a remorseless process. The problem is because the lakes go up and down like they do, it's kind of this two step forward, one step back process. When the lakes are high like they are now, they're gonna start eroding the shoreline really hard and fast. And then when they go back down, and they will, I can't tell you when or how far, but I can tell you pretty surely they're gonna go back down. The beach is kind of inflate again and it looks like they're accreting, but then they're gonna come back up again. So we're eroding, but it's kind of this slow back and forth process over time. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's the graph. We always show it. Um, it's like it's going up and down and up and down. And Lake Michigan and Huron are considered the same lake for the most part because they're connected at the, at the strait. So they have the same standing water levels. And the thing to notice is they go up and down and they go up and down. And we did have an unusually long period of low water on Lake Huron, Michigan for a stretch, but they come back up, right? From about the uh, late 90s until uh, 2013. So that's that long period where we saw lots of development, people starting to forget it. Um, that the lakes go back up and down. Well, here's some of the effects that that has. So, so just some imagery. Um, we've been doing, I should step back and say, the work we've been doing, a lot of it has been recently funded by the Coastal Zone Management Program. We've been working with communities around the lakes to figure out how to develop planning methods that are feasible and economically benefit or, you know, doable for them. But we've started on Lake Michigan and we're working our way around. So we're actually lining up to work with um, Port Austin and Alpena and St. Clair County this fall. Um, so we're moving around. The bad news for you all is all of my imagery is from Lake Michigan, sorry. <laughs> but a lot of the same ideas will carry over. So this is um, in Ludington, 
Uh, it's an image of what the beach looked like in 89. This is very shortly after that last long-term high. When the lakes are really high for a while, they chew away at the beach. They get rid of all of the, what, what my colleague up at Michigan Tech Guy Meadows calls sugar sand. If you can imagine sand as being light and fluffy. That sand gets pulled away, so what you've got are really flat, hardly com hard compacted beaches. And pretty wide beaches at this point because the lakes were going back down. So just another image. Look at that house and that break wall. See it? That's what it looked like 20 years later after that long period of low water levels. So the problem with the lakes is when the lakes go down, not only do they go down exposing more beach, because the waters are low, they start pushing sand up onto the beach. So you get these inflated sand dunes on the beach that make you think you've got more beach there than what you really do. That's the same house. You can't even see really the seawall, just a little bit of it left, but it's been buried. I went back this spring, that's the same house, all of that beach is gone. And I'm guessing it's even worse now. This was taken in March um, before the summer high. So all of that sugar sand has disappeared. The lakes are high. The lake is going to start chewing away at this shoreline really aggressively. If we get some storms this winter off of Lake Michigan, I, we're going to see some homes go into the lake, would be my guess. Um, and especially if they stay up for a while, it's going to be more of a problem. This is down at the edge of the Lake Michigan-Indiana border. Um, this was taken again in 88, just after the all-time high. Um, those are some researchers doing um, some field work. Those were some riprap that were thrown down to protect a road that's right up there. Look at where that pipe is sticking way out above the ground. That's what the beach looked like in 2008. Again, after 20 years of slow accretion, lots of sugar sand. You can barely see the pipe um, sticking out. It's been that much inflated by, that, by the beach coming up. That's, I went back last summer. I, so I have to tell you, I study coastal areas because you get to go out and visit coastal areas when you're studying coastal areas. So I had to do this as part of my research program. I went to Lake Michigan and surveyed the shoreline. All of that beach is gone again. That's the same riprap. And, and there was a legal dispute about whether someone wanting to build a house, and I noticed they built the house. Actually, they sold the property to somebody else who built the house. So I'm guessing, again, that the water is now much closer to that block than what it was a year ago. The lake's been high. So here's what's going on. This is a plain graph. This is a survey of a beach taken right by that property I just showed you. Um, and it's the, what the profile of the beach looks like over time at different time periods. And it's affected by the way the lakes go up and down. So here's um, what the shoreline looked like in, 2000, uh, in 1986 or 88. Not much beach left. The, the lakes had been high for a really long time. All that beach had been chewed away. Here's what it looked like in 97, about 10 years of low water pushing sand up onto the beach. 98, we had a period where it was chewing, chewing some of that beach away again. 2000, a really long period of low water. 2008, oh my gosh, we have 250 feet of extra beach on this property, but it's ephemeral. It's not going to be there for long. In fact, it's all gone. That's the beach that's disappeared now as the lakes have come back up. Um, so again, my colleague, a lot of the work I'm showing you is from a colleague, uh, Guy Meadows. He's a coastal engineer who's been studying this stuff for 30 years now. And um, we've been, he's developing a shoreline viewer. It's a little bit hard to see, but we're trying to track the sh movement of the shoreline over time. So the blue line on the far left is where the shoreline was, where the water was touching sand in 1938. The little bit darker blue line is where it was in 2016. So we've lost about, I don't know, 80 feet of beach on that stretch of shore. The golden rod on the left is where the bluff line was in 38. The next one, golden rod over, is where it is now. So we've lost a whole lot of bluffs. And the red line is where they think it'll be in about 50 years. Wow. So there's a lot of property at risk there. And here's the problem with nature. Nature's going to win, and when, bluff, when bluffs go, they don't go by inches, they go by multiples of feet, right? Because when the bluff finally fails, um, you can lose a lot, of, a lot of property. So those shoreline, and, and I, know, I know, so a lot of what I'm showing you is probably carries pretty well over to Lake Huron. I know when you get into Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie, it's much shallower and flatter. So you may not have quite the erosion problems, but you have worse 
flooding potentials here because a little bit of elevation change in water can go a whole lot more inland. So you're going to have more flooding difficulties, is my guess. All right now, I'm going to put my lawyer cap on. We're going to do a little bit of planning law. There are three key legal doctrines that play themselves out on a Great Lake shoreline. One is the police power prerogative, what I call police power prerogative. The second is the public trust doctrine, and the third are private property rights. Has anybody heard of those things? Yeah. Um, has anyone heard of the public trust doctrine? Yep. Curious. Yep. The, the regulators in the back prefer that. <laughs> um, anybody heard of private property rights? Yeah. I like to go out to, I go out and talk, work with local officials, and I always have local officials tell me, we're different from everybody else. We believe in private property rights. Let me tell you, I have never gone to a place in this country where has somebody said, no, we don't believe in private property rights here. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a doctrine that is part of our, part of our being. So now here's the, here's the first pop question. Which came first, of the, of the national, state, or local government in this country? Which came first? Are you a local official? <laughs> Usually the local officials say it was the local governments that came first. But that's not correct. Which came first? A lot of folks think it's the national because the national government plays such a big role in our lives today. Both of those are wrong. Okay, which came first? The states. Think about it. What were the original 13 colonies were chartered by the King of England? They became the original 13 states. When we separated ourselves from the crown, it was the states that were the plenary bodies, the plenary governments. We tried to do a national government right away. It didn't work too well. The Articles of Confederation, the founders came back together. They crafted the U.S. Constitution. The Constitution created the national government, and in the Constitution, it gave some powers to the federal government, but it left the vast majority of the powers to the states, the states of the plenary authorities. So now we do a lot of, our national government does a lot of things because a lot of the issues we're dealing with cross state lines. So you need a higher level of government to deal with those issues. But as a legal matter, it was the states that came first. Early on, early court cases tried to figure out, well, what is this power that the states have that they didn't give to the national government? And the label they came up with was the police power project. And you're gonna notice something. All of these are kind of case law, common law doctrines, and they're all old, dead, white guys. Because that's, <laughs> that's who made all of these rules. Roger Taney and Lemuel Shaw, um, Taney was a federal judge, and Lemuel Shaw was the chief justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court. And the formulation they came up with is that the states have what we call the police power. It's the power that lets us have police forces, but it's bigger than that. It's the power to protect public health, safety, morals, and the general welfare. Pretty much anything the state does, either in form of regulations or programs that are designed for public health and safety, that's coming out of our police power doctrine. Does that make sense? So the states have all of that authority, and for the most part, when it comes to managing land use, the states have delegated those authorities down to local government. So I'll talk more about that in a minute. That's the first doctrine. The second doctrine um, is the public trust doctrine. So the other thing that happened when we separated ourselves from the crown is the states tried to figure out, well, how do we resolve disputes? Where do we look to? for bodies of law that we can draw from, and we all look to England, jolly old England, and English common law, because that was our, you know, our Anglo-Saxon legal heritage, right? So we looked to English common law. Well, way back in English common law, they drew from ancient Roman law. And so Justinian was the emperor of Rome, sixth century, who first wrote down the laws of Rome, the common law, and, and he, one of the rules that was laid down in the Justinian code was the notion that there are some things that are common to all. The air, the running water, the sea, and the shores of the sea. These are resources that are not easily visible and they have some public attribute that allows for some notion of common access and use. That was the original formulation of the public trust doctrine. And that played out especially on the ocean coastal shorelines of ancient Rome. Well, when the island of England, England is an island, um, picked up that doctrine that Grafton and Matthew here were, were English treatise writers, and they repeated the same thing. Under English common law, some things are common to all, the air, the water, the sea, the shores of the sea. And then when the states separated themselves from the crown and started to think about how do we going to uh, 
rule on our waters, our resources, we all looked to the public trust doctrine. So early on, Michigan um, was, uh, became a state. Here's a quiz. Anybody know what year? 1837. 1837. 1837. The first court case I can find that mentions a Great Lake trolling dispute was like six years later. And the court said, well, of course, the state owns the submerged lands of the lakes because the court recognized and the courts have recognized ever since our Great Lakes are more like oceans than they are like inland lakes. Does that make sense? They behave more like oceans. In fact, when I talk to colleagues and point out to them that when you're standing on Lake Michigan or here and you can't see to the other side, that just blows them away. Really? It's an inland lake and you can't see to the other side? Yeah, they're really pretty big. Um, so they're pretty big. So the courts recognize these are more like oceans. We call them inland seas. All of the ocean coastal states in the United States and all eight Great Lakes states have adopted the public trust doctrine for, for our Great Lakes. So uh, the law I'm going to tell you now is not the same as inland lakes. So if you're an inland lake property owner, different laws apply to you. If you're a Great Lakes property owner, the public, doc, pu public trust doctrine applies to you. Under the public trust doctrine, the state owns the submerged land of the lake. So if you're in the water, you are standing on state land. The courts recognize what they call a movable freehold. When the lakes go up and down and back and forth and that boundary moves, your property line is moving back and forth, right? So you are naturally gaining some land sometimes when the lakes are low, but you're losing land when the lakes are high and when they're eroding away. That's part of the natural process of the lakes and that comes out of the public trust doctrine. Um, and then the other thing that the, the public trust doctrine do is gives us some access rights to the shorelands, the areas around that water's edge. And this is where the, the states differ a little bit. Um, and it's all key to the notion of an ordinary high water mark. And I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. I want to point out there's a third doctrine at play that's important in the American context, and it's the notion of private property rights, right? When you own private property, I'm a private property owner. I don't like the city of Ann Arbor necessarily telling me what I can and can't do, but I recognize there's a reason for that. When you own private property, you have the right to the reasonable use of your property. The reasonable use. You don't have the right to do whatever you want and the hell with the rest of them or the hell with your neighbor, pardon my language. Um, all, it, it is always the case that when you own private property, that's constrained probably because you have neighbors who have private property rights too, right? Your rights, your right to liberty extend as far as your fingertips. So you don't, the right to liberty means you can walk down the street. That doesn't mean you can walk down the street and wallop other people in the head because you have the right to wave your arms, right? Same thing with property. You have the right to use your property. You don't have a right to use it in a way that diminishes your neighbors or maybe the community's ability to use their properties as well. So. But that's an important right. It's the private property rights protect us from abuse of the government. It makes the government step through hoops when it's gonna regulate us. Sometimes it makes the government pay us when it regulates us to the point where we can't do absolutely anything with our property. It's called regulatory takings. So it's really these three doctrines are intention on a shoreline. It's the police power to promote the community uh, welfare. It's the public trust doctrine that's playing itself out on the shoreline. And then it's private property rights that are protecting us from being abused by the government. Does that make sense? I think so far. Okay, so those are the doctrines. The pro uh, and then I've, um, th all of this will be available to you. So I'm not going to step through these. But I just to point out, all of this then is embodied in statutory law and local government law. And the key things are the planning and zoning and enabling laws for local governments here. Um, so we're, we've got all of that played out. Here's the key problem on a Great Lake shoreline. You know this public trust doctrine played out in an ocean tidal setting where the water levels go up twice a day and down, right? So you have the right to beachcomb on an ocean coastal shoreline and you can kind of tell pretty easily where the ordinary high water mark is because it's more visible. And sea levels don't go up and down like Great Lakes do. So the way the beaches change over time don't, they happen a little bit, but not nearly as dramatically as they do on a Great Lake shoreline. How do you take that notion of an ordinary high water mark and put it on a Great Lake shoreline where the beach has changed so much over time? That's turned out to be a hugely difficult technical problem and it's a hugely difficult legal problem. So we actually have two ordinary high water marks. Has anybody heard of the Glass v. Goldhold decision? This came down in 2005. This is the beach walking case. 
So here's where the neighbor, this was where one neighbor decided, hey, I own this, it was up in, uh, Harrisville. Harris, was Harrisville? Yeah. yeah. Um, Shoreline property owner decided he didn't want his neighbor being able to walk on the beach in front of their property and they ended up in a lawsuit and it went all the way up to the Michigan Supreme Court, which decides these matters because this is state law. Each state has its own set of laws on this. And the Michigan Supreme Court said, yes, so we do indeed have the public trust doctrine. It's alive and well in the state of Michigan. And in Michigan, that means you have a right to walk on the beach below the ordinary high water mark. And it defined for beach walking purposes, the place on the ordinary high water mark is the place on the beach where you can see evidence of the presence of water in the past. Where do you think that is on this beach? <laughs> you're not, you're having the same troubles that everybody else is having. <laughs> else um, I think everybody accepts it, at the very least it's the, it's the grass. Those grasses, those are beach grasses. They come up in, in a year, right? When the lakes are low, when they're lower. There's been water there in the past. You can make a case, it's probably the tree line. What, in this part of the world, if you don't have water disturbing the ground, what do you, what'll come up? Trees, <laughs> trees, right? I don't think anybody wants to walk that far inland. They, they pretty much want to walk on the dry sandy beach. That's pretty well accepted. When this decision first came down, I would go out on the beaches and there were all these signs snow fences and signs into the water, private property, you can't do this. And I would say, folks, well, you can. The problem is you have to carry a copy of the glass decision with you and point out to the property owners where it said the court said you have right to walk. Now we're seeing these kinds of signs. You have a right to walk on the beach, please do that, but don't have a party in front of our property. I think that's actually a pretty good accommodation. So I like to say, think of these Great Lake beaches as a sidewalk in front of your house. People have the right to walk back and forth in front of your house and maybe admire the beautiful house you have. They don't have a right to have a barbecue on the sidewalk in front of your property or have a party or invite all of their friends. That's kind of the accommodation we need to figure out how to have. And I think a lot of shoreline property owners are getting there. I still hear of property owners who say, get off my beach. Can't really do that. I also hear people saying, that's my beach too and I can do whatever I want. Well, not really. You know, be a little bit respectful. You had a question. How is the St. River fit into this spot? That's a really good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So the seawalls, let me come back to that, yeah. So this is the, this is the beach walking ordinary high water mark. Everybody with me? So we have a right in Michigan. By the way, all of the Great Lakes states pretty much have this same rule, except for Ohio. Anybody here from Ohio? I'm actually from Ohio. And I still get grief when I go home about football. Um, in Ohio, the Ohio State Supreme Court ruled in Ohio, the ordinary high water mark is where the water is at the, any given moment. So if you want to be on public trust land on the beach in Ohio, you've got to be in the water. You've got to have your feet. <laughs> and all of the other Great Lakes states, they recognize some ability to walk on the dry sand beach. They have different right to walk. So that's, that's Michigan law here. The second ordinary high water mark is the regulatory mark. So the other way to think about how to know where water is, is to draw a horizontal line and say where that line hits the beach, landward of that is free, is property, free and simple, and lakeward of it, there's a public trust interest. And so there are elevations, um, one of the speakers mentioned the elevation above sea level, uh, the Great Lakes datum, that in the statute, in the Great Lakes Submerged Line, there's an elevation that says, in, for Lakes Michigan and Huron, where that elevation touches the beach, lakeward of that, the state has regulatory authority, Land rid of it, you can do whatever you want without having to get a state from that. The problem with that approach is remember how the beach goes up and down over time? That mark where it's hitting the beach goes back and forth over time. The, the people who made this approach, I think we're thinking this will be an easy to interpret and readily you know, stable line. It's not either of those things. It's really hard to interpret and it moves back and forth pretty dramatically. These hash marks are where that ordinary high water mark was touching the beach in 96, 98, 80, 90, uh, 88, and then the lakes were down for so long, the water mark was way out there, 
So the, the property owner here that started the lawsuit that led to this rule wanted to build that house. And the state of Michigan put an image of what that house looked like under what the beach had looked like 20 years prior, the last Jordan and I wanted like to show. Your, what you want to build on was underwater 20 years ago. And when I read the lawyer's briefs for the property owners, they were saying, this is above the ordinary watermark. There hasn't been water here for 4,000 years. <laughs> I'm thinking, where did they get that number? <coughs> it was something like that, something crazy like that. The, the courts don't really understand this process. That's all underwater again. That's the same image I showed you. That beach is all gone. So had they built that house there, it would be underwater right now. So that, that's the dynamics. At any rate, under... If you want to build land lakeward of that, you have to get a permit from the state. So that's the regulatory folks in the back. So if you want to put a structure in submerged lands of the lakes, you got to get a permit. If you want to do something up to the ordinary high water mark, you might need to get a permit. If, especially if you're in an area that's called a high risk erosion area, where the state determines this shoreline is especially is already especially fast, you might need to get a permit and you might need to build a structure that you can move back over time. Although some of the structures, I'll just say, that are supposed to be movable, don't look very movable to me. <laughs> <laughs> Here's kind of the poster child. Anybody know this city? Take a guess. Um, it, I had the name of it on the first slide. You clearly were not paying attention to my slides. Um, this is St. Joseph. <clears throat> this is St. Joseph. Um, anybody has to guess where the people who built that house lived before they built that house? Chicago, I always hear that. People on that side of the state do not like Chicagoans very much. <coughs> um, these folks actually live right there. <laughs> and they had lived there for a really long time. They were lake, long, long time lake floors. And the lakes, remember, they were so low for so long, they decided we, the lakes are low, we think we'd like to build our house closer to the lake. Let me show you some imagery. So this is uh, what that shoreline looked like in 38, 60, 85, that's the house, that their back house is now there. Uh, or is that, that's 96. <clears throat> 2002, 2011, the house has been built. Oh. That's where the water has been in years past. That stretch of shoreline has been underwater multiple times uh, since 1938. How did that happen? When they went to build their house, the city didn't have any regulations in place to tell them you can't do that. And because of the way the state interprets where the ordinary watermark is, the state said, yep, you're landlord of the ordinary watermark, you don't need to get a permit for us. The city manager, who's a certified pun fund manager, kept telling them, don't do it, don't do it, it's a bad idea, don't do it. They did it. Um, the city, the neighbors got really mad because what are they thinking? When the lakes come back up, they're gonna wanna put an armory to protect the other house. And what's gonna happen? It's gonna start eroding away more quickly all of the other beach around them. Remember the nuisance doctrine, you can't harm your neighbors? The property owners gave the city a bunch of money to hire an engineering firm to do a study so that they could justify adopting a setback to prevent other people from building um, shorelines out. And then, and, and they did it, they set it, so the sh that setback is now about here, which made this house a non-conforming structure. And guess what happened in 2013 when the lakes came back up? The property owners approached the city and said, we want to get a permit to armor. And the city said, no, we advised you not to build. And we've now adopted a setback and we're not allowing any structures um, lakeward. And so they picked up the house and they moved it back. Oh. <laughs> so here's another story to tell you. I gave this presentation in South Haven. Well, did you hear that? <laughs> um, I gave this presentation in South Haven and we were having dinner and talked to a restaurant manager and he was like, I heard about that house and I heard they were going to get a permit and a good buddy of mine moves houses and he went to that meeting because he said, I bet they're going to have to move their house and he took his business card. And so, <laughs> and so I got these images off of that house moving website because now they're advertising, look what we can do. <laughs> so they had to move it back. They really couldn't move it back as far as they should have because there are other houses in the room. <laughs> so their house is still going to be at risk. Now, to their credit, they're, they're a little bit north of an inlet, the, the harbor inlet for the river that's causing some accretion. And they thought they were safe because of the accretion that's happening because of the inlet, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't.
wasn't enough. So they, they, they got a little bit caught. So now here's the other problem. Um, here's the other point I'll make. In general, the source of sand that keeps replenishing our Great Lakes beaches are the bluffs behind the, the beach on the, on the, along the shore. Let me say that again. As the lakes go up and down, it erodes away at the, at the bluffs on the beach. It's pulling sand down. It's that sand that keeps replenishing the shorelines. And as the lakes keep getting higher and they push sand out into the water depth, if the sand gets far enough out, the, the, beach, the lake can't push it back up. So when you put in a seawall, you're starving the beach of the sand supply it needs to replenish itself. So over time, as we start building, whoops, more and more shoreline armoring, we're gonna lose the beach. So I've heard other Army Corps of Engineers, engineers point out, we may be in the long-term looking at the New Jerseyization of the Michigan shoreline. As we build more and more shoreline seawalls and we starve off the beaches, we're gonna lose the beaches. And at some point, even though the lakes go down and up and down and they push sand up for a while, there's not enough sand left in the system to push sand back up onto the beach, even when the lakes are low. So now we're starting to see places where beach walls have been there for a while that the beaches just don't come back. So communities, I, this is a hard call for communities because it's gonna be you locals who have to deal with this, are gonna have to decide, are we gonna protect the beach house? Or are we gonna protect the beach? Because there could well be places where we can't do both. And, we, and I respect and I understand private property rights and I get people wanting to protect their beaches or their beach houses. But you also ought to know if we let people protect their beach houses by putting up seawalls, you're going to lose your beach. And if that beach is important to you for economic development purposes and quality of life, that could be a huge impact. So there are really hard trade offs that we're facing here. And it's only going to get worse because all the climate science is predicting the highs are going to get higher and the lows are going to get lower, and we're going to see more extremes and more of this kind of action. So I think we're just at the front end of really grappling um, with those difficult issues. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So there are two things. There are some places on the shoreline that are actually pretty stable. We don't really know why. So part of the work that Guy Meadows is doing is better mapping the shoreline to figure out where, where is it stable and people are good and where is it eroding more quickly that we need to worry about. So there's some work to be done there yet. The other thing is I recognize there are communities that are so built out it just doesn't make sense to tell people you gotta pull those seawalls out. That would be too much damage. So both, um, I'll show you in a minute, both Grand Haven and, and St. Joseph have basically done triage. There are portions of their beach they're allowing to stay in seawall, knowing there's not going to be a beach there. And there are other portions where they said, nope, we're going to put setbacks in and we're going to move them back. So property owners there need to know, at some point, you're probably going to have to pick up your house and move it, because we're not going to let that part of the beach get walled off. So that may be a trade-off that your community has to face. So how do you deal with this? We're dealing with shoreline movement, natural fluctuations, you do it through community planning. So the methods, I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but um, if you're interested in this, pay attention. We'll be doing work again for St. Clair, for Lake St. Clair County, St. Clair County, and a lot of the jurisdictions in that area. And we'll be doing some of the mapping that I'll show you and helping those communities think through how to plan for those areas. Um, and part of the problem, so I mentioned 318 communities have Great Lakes waters. Very few of them are doing this because it's expensive. A lot of these communities, 90% of Michigan's Great Lakes coastal communities have 10,000 or fewer residents, a lot of new townships. They don't have the bandwidth to be doing this kind of involved planning. So we've been trying to develop planning methods that are feasible. They're technologically sound, but they're feasible with off-the-shelf data and basic GIS analysis. And we've been developing what we're calling scenario-based planning. So the idea here is, I'm not gonna predict for you what your shoreline's gonna look like in 20 years, because I don't know. But I can give you a range from kind of a happy future to an unhappy future of what it might look like based on climate future. So we call that the lucky future, the expected, <laughs> and the perfect storm. And then we can set that against, well, here's what you currently have. Here's what you could get if you build out completely <coughs> under your current zoning regulations. And here's what you might get if you adopt some best management practices like setbacks from water features. And when you combine each of those conditions, you get a scenario, and then we can analyze, well, how many structures are at risk? How much shoreland area is at risk? What's the fiscal impact of the, of the potential damage from storms and such? So the lucky is the lakes are low, not too stormy. Pretty much what we had 
during that stretch between 2000 and 2011. That was a lucky period. There was a lot of building that happened that maybe shouldn't have happened. The expected is where we think is pretty much the long-term standing water level. And, and we think the 100-year storm, have you heard of a 100-year storm? Yes. So it's, that's a really bad name because it makes people think, well, we had that last year, so we're not going to have it for another 99 years. <clears throat> Don't think of it that way. It's really the 1% storm. It's the storm that in any given year could happen. The problem is the 1% storm is really, be, the 100-year storm is really becoming more like the 50-year storm. And what we used to think of as the 500-year storm is really becoming more like the 100-year storm. In fact, Houghton, Michigan, two years ago, had three 500-year storms in one summer. We're seeing increased storminess. And whether or not you believe in climate change or what's causing it, I'll tell you, get over the debate on what's causing it, I'll tell you what's happening. And we need to deal with it. We need to adapt to it because it's going to affect our shorelands and how we're going to be hit by these storms, right? So the perfect storm is, uh-oh, the lakes are close to their all-time high. That sounds like ring a bell. And yeah. the 500-year, the now maybe the 100-year storm, maybe the 50-year storm hits. We could see lots of damage. And the kinds of damage you see is both inundation from water getting pushed up from storm surges. And if you're in a, a community that's got a river, we might have problems with especially riverine water coming down that can't go anywhere because the lakes are higher. They can't get out as fast as they used to. So increased riverine flooding. Uh, and then wave action on the shore, especially in bluff areas, you could really lose some bluffs pretty quickly if the, if the uh, coastal storm is chewing away at them. Here's some mapping we did for Green Haven. This is the amount of area that would be underwater during a lucky climate future. All of the black areas are built out structures. Most of that is actually the river, but there's some shoreland over here. There's some structures sitting in the water. I don't know how that happened. I don't think they've been managing their floodplain coordinates very well. That's the land area that could be underwater during an expected future. I wouldn't be surprised to see this happen this fall. Maybe if we get the right storm. <laughs> That's the perfect storm. Now we're starting to see shorefront wave action damage. And now we're starting to see a lot more riverine flooding. So a lot of the damage that's happening here. So um, I'll make another aside. Has anybody been to North Carolina and seen what the houses look like on the beaches there? What, how, what's unique about them? They're up on stilts. Why is that? You know? The old ones washed away. The old ones washed away. Well, I don't feel it, actually. But, um, they're up on stilts because FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the National Flight Insurance Program, requires if you're in what's called a high velocity wave zone, a VE zone, that you have to elevate your structure so that if the waves come through, it washes underneath the structure instead of wiping out the structure. That's why all those homes are up on stilts. FEMA has never mapped VE zones in the Great Lakes. I can't find a good explanation for it. it is, but they're getting ready to. They've been doing it in a preliminary way. And so they might start mapping VE zones. So if you own property right on the shore and you've got a structure, you might end up having to, I don't know if they would make you come in and retroactively elevate, but you might start seeing more structures up on stilts on the Great Lakes because of the wave action that's happening here. Okay, so that's the what could be flooded. This is how we, we might change development patterns. So everybody has current development. Most communities we work with have zoning codes. Most communities I talk to say, oh, we're all built out. We're not going to build out anymore. And I tell them that's not anywhere close to true. You have way more ability to build than you probably think you do, because that's typical for communities. And then it's possible to say, well, let's adopt. What if we adopted some setbacks from water features? What would happen then? So here's what Grand Haven looks like currently. That's what could get built under their current zoning. The yellow dots are commercial buildings. The are the yellow are Residential, the red are commercial. There's, they've still got a lot of building left. They told me, oh no, we're built out. We're not going to see more building. That's what could happen with BMPs. Notice the difference? We're not telling local governments you can't continue to grow in development. We're suggesting maybe there's some places that are better to grow in development than others. The difference between the, the build out with BMPs is that you're not seeing so much development right in harm's way, right along the river's edge. Here's the numbers. So currently in Grand Haven, they've got 17 structures at risk under a lucky future, 142 under an expected, 189. If they build out and they don't do any VMPs, they could see another 234 of their perfect storm at risk. That's 234 in addition to the 189. 
if they adopt 50 foot setback, that's all we modeled, 50 foot setbacks, they could reduce the number of additional structures at risk from my 234 to 41. So here's another message. We're never gonna be able to completely avoid risk unless we live in bubbles and completely protect ourselves. That's never gonna happen. We're always gonna to have to deal with some amount of risk, but you can do some things to greatly mitigate the potential risk you might have by trying to get folks to build in better places and maybe thinking about the places that are at risk, how do we deal when the storm comes with, do we build it back to the way it was and then watch it get like that again? Maybe, that makes sense. Or maybe we say now it's time to pick up and move out and turn that land into something else. That's another difficult issue. So how do we do that through regulation? Plans are not legal documents, they're just policy documents. It's the zoning code that now adopts laws and tells people what they can't can do. Why might you adopt a zoning code in a hazard in a, in a coastal setting for hazard mitigation to try and deal with this problem of structures being at great and places of great risk? You might start dealing with what do we do after the storm comes? Who's going to pay to clean it up? Are we going to let people build back to the way it was? Are we going to say now's the time to pick up and move out? How are we going to deal with that? Um, there are important coastal resources we can protect, wetlands and, and dunes and such, that we could do through local zoning initiatives. Aesthetics. Uh, people want to have sites, sight lines to the shore, right? If you're not a shore property owner, but you live a little bit back, you probably value having a shoreline view. There are communities that regulate how tall you can build right along the shore. So that's, that happens through zoning as well. And then public access. So options, I'm gonna move through this quickly. Um, you can do nothing and then just kind of wait and see what FEMA does or the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, you can try and deal with it through general provisions like protecting your wetlands or your steep slopes. A lot of communities are doing that. You can adopt coastal shoreline districts and say these are the areas we're gonna give special attention to. And here, you're gonna still allow development but you maybe will restrict where exactly it can happen or how, whether or not someone has to elevate their structure or have to put in some extra structural protections. You might have a setback, and the idea on a setback is if you're like of the setback, you can't build there. Or, or if you've got a property that's there, it's an unconforming use, you can continue to be there maybe forever if the storm doesn't hit. But if the storm hits and, you, and it damages your property more than some percent, 50, 60%, now's the time to take it out and, and move it out of that high hazard zone. That would be that setback. The key with a Great Lakes setback is you have to recognize it's got to move. Remember, the shorelands and the Great Lakes are slowly moving landward over time. So the ordinary high water mark slowly moves landward over time. Setbacks are going to have to move slowly landward over time. That's just the natural process of the lakes. That's the way the lakes work. Nobody likes to hear that because it's a painful thing to hear. Uh, and then maybe, maybe we can deal with some who's going to pay for this Maybe property owners who are in the highest risk places should have put some money aside to help people clean up the mess. That, that's an idea we haven't looked into much. Um, the big challenge with, the set, with setbacks is how do you fix where the boundaries are? It's, it turns out to be a really difficult technical challenge. How do you know where's a fair place to draw that line and say, here's the setback, Lakewood, if you're, you've got to deal with the lake, landward, you're good. <coughs> And then, and then the idea is what provisions do you adopt? You might adopt setbacks, you might, ideally communities should not be allowing plats to be laid out in a way that blocks in a shoreline property owner. The best shoreline lots are long skinny lots that have lots of room to pick up your house and move it back. That's the ideal. We've gotten into trouble in a lot of communities where they've let people plat up right next. So you're, you can't move your house back because your neighbor is behind you. What do you do with your house? So if you're in a community that hasn't, hasn't thought this through or, or you know, there's some room left, you might be able to think that through and, and deal with that issue. Um, you might require armoring, elevation, movable structures. You might put, require some green infrastructure. Um, this is just to show you the map of Grand Haven. They went through this exercise and they ended up adopting a setback. So their new setback basically follows that line. And what they've told their property owners are, you're good where you are now, we're gonna keep adjusting the setback. There may come a time where you're gonna to have to pick up your house and move back, because the lakes are slowly moving landward. This is, the, this is what the city of St. Joseph adopted um, after the house got moved. See, that's where that house became an unconforming use. They've moved it back. The tip of it is still just landward, or lakeward of that setback line. So if, they, they may be in trouble at some point, but they did that 
they did that setback based on the engineering studies that, that they hired. The planning methods we are using, you can get to the same good quality analysis, but at a fraction of the cost. So all of the work we're doing with the help from Rhonda and our team, the Michigan Tech and Leah and, and others is trying to help coastal communities grapple with these issues. Let me come back to your question. What happens if you put up a seawall and the beach isn't where it used to be, but we have a public trust right to walk on the beach? Does that mean people can walk in your backyard? I don't know, because it hasn't been litigated. It hasn't been litigated. It's, that'll get resolved in the courts, probably. Nobody's sued on that. Here's another question. If the state has a duty to protect the public trust, and, and our citizens of the state have a public trust right to walk on the beach, and we know that putting seawalls in means we lose the public trust beach, does that mean the state has a duty to tell the shoreline property owners to take the seawall out so the beach comes back? I don't know. It hasn't been litigated. That'll be something that gets resolved probably in the courts. Maybe not. Maybe the likes will go back down, people will forget, and a lawsuit won't happen. Or maybe it will. We'll see. Um, the other reason I don't know about Lake St. Clair, it's not entirely clear to me how, on these connecting rivers how, where, how far the pub, this speech walking public trust doctrine Wait, extends. Does it say lake? Does it say it's the lake waters, yeah. So I think DEQ Eagle, I think, has some rules on how they interpret it. I don't think the courts have litigated it, so there's a little bit uncertainty. I don't think the their laws are quite the same on the rivers as they are on the lakes. But they're not. They're not. Say, yes. Tell me, correct me. Yeah. Connecting waters, consider them to the river, the the So they're following the law of riparian inland lakes, then. Yeah. So if you're, by the way, if you're an inland lake and you own lakefront property, you own to the center of the lake. Basically, you own the submerged lands. There's a public trust right to float a canoe. So you can't kick someone off who's fishing, you know, wading in front of you on the canoe, but you own the bottom of it. So the connecting waters are treated that way. Okay, yes. that, that was good. Thank you for being here. Um, so you're on the rivers are different, it's the different legal system. But if you're on Lake Huron, Great Lakes waters, the submerged lands are above. So uh, this is where I have to say questions. <clears throat> Did I do that right? Did I on time? You're on time, Dick. Thanks. And if I could have all of our speakers come on up here, and uh, we are going to do some question and answer. I have about uh, seven minutes before 8 p.m., and uh, you guys probably have questions that have come on up. Uh, could be legal questions, coastal questions, uh, program questions, or weather questions, and uh, we'll be glad to uh, start. And I'm going to repeat those so people can hear them as they pick them up. And if the speaker, whoever answers that question, if they could go up to the microphone, that would probably be best for us to uh, pick up on, uh, on our Facebook program. So, yes, we're going to go right back here first. Try to answer the great question was about uh, glacial melt, and it, I, I I'm assuming it's contribution to the net basin supply. So net, we consider net basin supply to be precipitation plus runoff minus evaporation. So, so not considered. It's not considered. Okay. The glaciers form the Great Lakes, but they're not, they have solid long since receded. Right. Great, we're gonna go right up here. Yeah, it's a question not necessarily related to the water level, it's the condition of the lake itself. For the past two years, I've noticed foam coming on the lake that I've never seen in 34 years. This year, the foam is much, the foam is much more heavy. It looks like soap sets. And I've asked the DEQ if they can give me an idea what that might be. Is it toxic? Is there something going on in the lake? North of us is coming from Satellite County now to the St. Clair County. And I'm not able to find any answers yet as to what this foam is. Is it high hazardous at all? Anybody have any clue? So it's a question on foam on the surface of Lake Huron, evidently. I'm going to hand it back to Andy Hartz and see if he has any questions, any comments. I only know about this because um, it is an issue that one of our guys in our office, Ryan Schwartz, has been looking at. Um, I know that um, staff of Eagle have been up to the shoreline. You're talking about um, like um, Lakeport area, Port Gratiot. Birchville Township, Birchville, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, um, we've had we had those reports, and I don't know about them. It's not my specific unit, but I do know that we've been looking at that. I can get you in touch with the person that is investigating that if you'd like. That would be great. Yep. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Yes, we'll go up front there. Go ahead. 
Norton, you mentioned bottomlands. What does it mean if someone is issued a bottomland deed from the DNR? What does that mean? So there are, yeah, well, this is the arcana of law. Um, so the, it is possible under the Public Trust Doctrine and the Great Lakes Submerged Land Act for the state to patent bottomlands. So it is possible for the state to, to basically transfer property ownership to bottomlands. They have to, when they do that, they have to justify there's some larger public interest there. But if someone has a deed for a bottomlands patented from the state, then they, they would own that. Uh, that would be a place where the property owner would own that bottomland. Would that mean that they can do anything they want with it? I don't know that it's, well, no. Because <laughs> you can never do anything you want with your property. But there may still be restrictions. But I think it means you're the owner of that piece of land. There's also a little bit of confusion. So does, that mean, does that mean that they could fill it in and reclaim it? That's usually why people get deeds to bottomlands because they're trying to create a marina or a port or something. And so they get the bottomlands transferred so they can fill it to create some kind of structure. So that's my understanding. Great, go right there. Is Lake St. Clair considered a great lake? Identify itself? So it's um, legally, it is subject to the same doctrines as the Great Lakes. The, the limnologists, the lakes folks, I always ask them, why is it not a Great Lake? It's kind of an almost Great Lake, I guess. Um, <laughs> pretty darn good. <laughs> it's a pretty darn good lake. Let's just put that on the table. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not a great lake, but it's a pretty darn good one. Um, from the public trust doctrine legally, it's, so far as I know, it's treated the same as the Great Lakes. Yes, sir. We see scuba divers in the St. Clair River, kind of just by chance, they found an incredible whatever treasure Oh man, <laughs> you didn't tell me there were any of these kinds of questions. No. <laughs> so the maritime law. The, the question no was idea. about if a scuba diver found something on the bottom of St. Clair River. So I'm kind of looking back to Andy to see if he has any comments. By the bottom, those kind of indicators and treasures are protected on the submerged land. Lake St. Clair is covered by the Great Lakes Submerged Land Act. So that's either public property or property of the person that owned the ship, but it's bank. I mean, very technical. It's really complicated maritime yeah. Yeah. And there, There's kind of an ethic now with the diving community, whereas 30 years ago there wasn't. And uh, I, think, I think that, you know, would come into play. Maybe similar. I mean, uh, there's a lot of, you know, catch and release for the muscalunge in, in Lake St. Clair. So different ethics have changed, I think, a little bit with that, too. <clears throat> Has any thought been given to sand reclamation on the bottom of the lake? So the question was, has any thought been given to sand reclamation from the bottom of the lakes? And I know Dr. Norton has worked with Dr. Meadows and others on this. My understanding is that um, the state has been reticent to allow dredging from bottomlands to re-nourish beaches. It's happening in a few places where the um, Army Corps does dredging for like for river channels. And then, uh, so St. Joseph actually benefits greatly because they have their river is regularly dredged. The Corps just brings those spoils around and dumps it on the beach. So they're getting natural re-nourishment. But so far as I know, do you know, the state is not letting people dredge from bottomlands to re-nourish. When we were in uh, Atlantic City several years ago after one of their hurricanes, they had huge platforms, movable, out in the water yep. that brought a slurry in and they deposited on the beach and built you know, sand up. So the so the so far as I know the state's not allowing that. The other issues with that is who's paying for that and who's benefiting from it and how often is it gonna happen? And so in North Carolina they would re nourish and one storm would come in and all of that would be gone. It's a storm. So it's a it's a temporary fix that's gonna have to be repeatedly done over and over again. And I don't know there have been good studies on the Great Lake Shorelines to know how how prudent it would be. It may be though it would be a fruitful thing to do in some places. Certainly if the core's already dredging to keep water channels open, that's a great use of those spoils, but that's only where there are rivers that the core is right now already dredging. I know this lady's had her hand up before, so we're going to go right to you. Yeah. So, can you show me a picture of a house in the back of the and you can see how the erosion is going by? They have seawater. And what we're going to do is stop that. How does the jetty play into this? 
I don't think DQ is allowing Jetty. D I keep saying DQ, Eagles. Are you guys allowing Jetties anymore? Uh, we're pretty careful about that. We're talking about Jetties and groins. Groins, yeah. Yeah. So you're talking about a structure that sticks out into the lake. That's 18 inches over the water I'll hazard, you guys, I mean, you guys are pretty, you know. Yeah. The problem with grain fields is you're starting to, you're trapping, you're robbing Peter to feed him. You're trapping sand and you're forcing out everybody to put out their grain field. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so here's where I say, so someone early on said, a lot of these issues really become very site specific. So I can kind of give you gener generalities, but in your case, you'd have to have a coastal geologist come out and take a look at it and do a study. Well, so then, so the other thing that has not been litigated is if you're a shoreland property owner and your neighbor puts in a seawall that starts to erode your property, do you have a lawsuit? There's one court of appeals case that suggests you might, but it's not clear to me the court would go there and it hasn't been litigated so far as I can tell. So that may be another lawsuit that we see one neighbor suing another because they put in a seawall. Oh, There's our core guy back there. <laughs> By the way, I didn't. Even... I have the microphone. I can, oh, yeah. I can move the microphone back. <laughs> yeah. um, I didn't mention the core also issues permits. They have an ordinary watermark that's different from the state's ordinary watermark. But if you're under their ordinary watermark, you have to get a permit from the core too. It's really case, it really is case by case. These systems are so dynamic. You can make general statements, but it really comes down in any one place to what's going on in this place. Okay. Case by case basis. So we're gonna come, where's the question back there, Justin? Yes, please. Okay, yeah, whoever, just ask the question and we'll get the right speaker. Thank you. I know we're not gonna know We did an operation. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do okay. <laughs> I know, Keith. I think okay. I think that's for you. Okay, so I'll come at this from you know as what conditions would lead to significant water level declines for next year. So a continuation of a cool, dry fall would evaporate water from the lakes because the lakes are relatively warm. Uh, in the fall, we get the cool, dry air that moves over them. That forces the evaporation. Move into the winter. We don't want a healthy snowpack. Um, we want a, a warm, snowless winter, followed by a <laughs> warm, dry spring. <laughs> that would lead to significant water level declines uh, next year. Can the weather service assist in that? <laughs> okay, we're gonna go right here, please. I live on Archie's Island, or on a peninsula. And around the peninsula where all the homes are, it's all seawalled in except for the lot of my house, which is state-owned wetland, no seawall. As the water rises, Pushes in that, pushes into that wetland. I'm about 18 inches above that wetland, but it, it keeps rising. I keep building up, knocking the sandbags off. It just kept rising. The water would come in in the storm, and I'd have white gaps in the back of my house, and I can't hardly stop it. So, does this, can I build? Can I build a wall on my lot line? Stop that the wetland. I, I tried to buy it, they didn't sell it. So, so I'm uh, like, I'm, I'm it, it's a question about a, a Harsons Island property owner with some adjacent state land, and I think it is a regulatory question. And I, I would encourage you to talk with Andy Beth and uh, <laughs> Lucas back there specifically about that issue. And obviously, it's a serious issue. And, and I think uh, I think it's nice to have the people right here locally that you can talk to. So, but thank you, thank you for bringing that. So, yeah, question here. Uh, uh, on the Niagara River, all day, 
down and go halfway across the Niagara River. Uh, are those flow rates uh, varied by the conditions that we have in the Great Lakes? If you can repeat the question. Yeah, so the, the question is about the Niagara River and the control works that are uh, just upstream of the Niagara Falls. So uh, that the operation of that structure is mandated by the IJC through the International Niagara River Board of Control. And the IJC oversees the regula regulation of the outflows from Lake Superior and Lake Ontario as well. Um, that regulatory structure in uh, cooperation with the hydropower companies is used to keep the level of the Grass Island pool, which is upstream of the Niagara Falls, at a certain level. Um, that structure does not contribute to the changing of the total flow in the Niagara River or uh, the influence on Lake Erie's water level. Thanks, we're gonna go right there for a question. Yes, yeah, please. I'm not into the floor, but I really didn't want to know when the water started coming up. I saw it really hard about it. I didn't know what to do. You know, I, is there one government I can catch up to and say, hey, what should I be doing? I got most of it from going to the, the sandbag place, you know, and hearing what your neighbors are doing. And, and the same thing, and not so much even government, but even private, I would say, I would love to have somebody go and say, I think the water's going to keep coming up. Here's what you should do for the future, for next year and for next year. I don't even know who to call for that. The flood guy? <laughs> so, so the question is, is there one government agency to go to for kind of advice and um, um, issues relating to these higher water level regimes? And is there assistance? Thank you for coming tonight, because I think we're trying to bring some of the science here and some of the information to you. So, um, uh, Keith, do you want to mention any technical assistance from the Corps for as it relates to um, public the, infrastructure? The, the Corps really works through uh, our, the, the state and then down to the county. So a lot of times uh, we're interacting with the county emergency managers after they have exhausted resources. They go to the state and the state asks the Corps, can you provide technical assistance? And the Corps is providing technical assistance to a number of counties in Michigan, including St. Clair County, um, to protect public infrastructure. And that's kind of where the, uh, the Corps' involvement is, is to protect public uh, infrastructure. Well, I know about the private property owner. Is there a private thing? I don't know what the numbers there. So what I don't do is say, here's what I will do. But I know it's it's a hard question, and you know there really isn't one place. Um, my experience uh, that they're not real uh, strong shoreline property owners groups along the Great Lakes. I know Emmett County does have one that's pretty active, but most of them are are individuals, and they're not really well aggregated and not well associated. So I I think coming to meetings like this is a really great start because you have the regulatory people here. You have the educational experts, and you have some people with that manage state programs that have some resources uh, that have helped, you know, like the Coastal Zone program, and it's a you know a, a matching program. So, so Dick, thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll make, I don't want to try not to cast aspersions, but um, if you think you might want to build a seawall, there are a lot of contractors out there who build seawalls. Um, there have been very limited studies, as I understand it, that really document, clearly show what the effects of different kinds of seawalls in different places have on the shoreline over time. In fact, the court has given a pretty big study dealing with that issue. There are a lot of contractors out there who will tell you their, their kind of armoring structure will, is the cure to all of your problems. So you need to be a little careful. Um, when you when folks tell you oh, my shoreline structure will solve all of your problems because there are lots of there's lots of evidence of failed armor structures from years past that were probably sold to those property owners that this will solve all of your problems it's like, you don't have to look very hard once the lakes come up to see shoreline structures that are in the lake and, and part of that is the lakes are hugely powerful forces and they're just going to keep eroding on the shoreline so somebody's spending a lot of money to try and armor the shoreline and at some point they 
not going to go up and say it's just not worth it. But be a little bit cautious. When you do go out and seek that kind of advice, just be a little bit cautious about what you're hearing. Thank you. We're going to go right in front. So what are good resources for natural things you can do for your land so that you can help the flow so you don't have so much eroding, uh, so your grass isn't all gone? Yeah. <laughs> that living on the coast booklet that was in my uh, presentation that has some good information in it. Um, I don't know if we can bring that link back up or make that link available um, to everybody. But uh, you know that was developed in the late uh, mid to late nineties, um, following the, the higher water levels of nineteen ninety seven. So that's one source. We can get some of that. It's also on the website as well. There's um, some cog has also done a. Um, green infrastructure uh, book. So green infrastructure is the idea of trying to slow water down and keep it on site and, and treat it that way. Um, so they've got a great book on low impact development, it's called. The Tip of the Mid Watershed Council also has living shoreline guidelines. Most of those documents though are really designed for inland lakes that don't have the energy <coughs> that the Great Lakes do. So the ability to use those kind of living shoreline Approaches may be constrained if you're on a part of the lake, which just gets lots of wave action. But those are other sources you might have to. We're going to go back to Lori. Are there a cost to any of your levels of government um, about the stuff we were talking about, seawall, about the homeowners and the homeowners that don't have the shore softening technique instead of seawall? Uh, a shore softening technique is better for the environment and is there any grant available to that? Is there any cost about the program? Not that I know of, Lori. I mean, we, for the coastal program, because we're federal funded, it has to be on public lands. Um, but we do have documents about um, nature based shorelines for inland lakes. Um, as far as our um, wetlands and inland lake streams, folks, we have that on the website. Um, so there are some measures and practices that for guidance for BMPs. But at this point in time, um, I don't know of individual um, subsidies for that. So I think a lot of homeowners would like to have a technique that's better for the environment, but the cost of the seawall is in there to tie, so there's an incentive, I think, to go along with We just have to say the one thing you don't want to do, apparently this is happening, is don't build a septic system right the of your house. Right. If you live a, a septic, septic system. system. If you live on a bluff, and the county doesn't tell you otherwise, and apparently this has happened. People have put their septic tanks on the lake side of their houses. What, what they're doing is injecting water into the bluff and they're causing it to fail faster. So these low impact development water, you really have to be careful with how you redirect water in these settings, because you might actually accelerate erosion if you're not careful. Whatever you do, don't put your septic tank on the lake side of your house. So would you join me in just thanking all the speakers for all the information they made available. <laughs> Thanks again to St. Clair County for hosting this meeting. Thanks again and uh, stay around and ask questions and uh, drive home safely.